Direct primary care is an innovative alternative path to insurance-driven health care. Typically, a patient pays their doctor a low monthly membership and, in return, builds a lasting relationship with their doctor and has their doctor available at their fingertips. Welcome to the My DPC Story podcast, where each week you will hear the ever so relatable stories shared by physicians who have chosen to practice medicine in their individual communities through the direct primary care model. I'm your host, Marielle Conception, family physician, DPC owner, and former fee-for-service doctor. I hope you enjoy today's episode and come away feeling inspired about the future of patient care, direct primary care. Direct primary care allows me to be the doctor I thought I would be when I wrote my medical school essays about being a doctor. I actually get to practice the way medicine should be and the way I'm trained to without the interference of all the other bureaucracy. I'm Dr. Matthew Hayden of Modern Mobile Medicine, and this is my DPC story. Dr. Matthew Hayden was born and raised in Nebraska. He completed his Bachelor of Science at Nebraska Wesleyan University and then attended the University of Connecticut School of Medicine for a joint MD and Master's of Public Health program. Dr. Hayden completed 18 months of residency training at Georgetown Providence Hospital in Washington, D.C., before transferring to the Mayo Clinic, Arizona, where he completed his specialty training in family medicine. He is board certified in family medicine and has worked for several years in urgent care and primary care. While working as a doctor, he also went to business school and obtained his MBA to help in his entrepreneurial endeavors. He was founder and CEO of Mobile MDs, an on-demand service for doctors' house calls, serving travelers at hotels and resorts across the U.S. After several years of growing that business, he decided to return his focus to primary care and restoring the doctor-patient relationship through the direct primary care model. Dr. Hayden has traveled extensively and even lived abroad for a time in Egypt and Costa Rica. Over the past 20 plus years, he has enjoyed the opportunity to visit Rome, Casablanca, Malta, Gibraltar, Montreal, Ottawa, several parts of India, Nepal, Mexico, Trinidad, and the Dominican Republic. These experiences have helped him to better understand how one's culture can influence health and the treatment preferences of patients. Dr. Hayden enjoys working out, visiting family, drinking coffee, playing the drums, driving his electric car, and spending quality time with his wife, daughter, and son. He was selected as a 2015-2016 Fellow of the Leonine Forum at the Catholic Information Center in Washington, D.C., and has volunteered with the Order of Malta Federal Association Auxiliary. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Hayden. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a treat. Uh, I am just coming back from a conference where I was able to, you know, get an update on what's going on in the Hill and you are right by the Hill. So this is fantastic. With regards to modern mobile medicine, we've heard a little bit of the story from Dr. Marguerite Duane, who's no longer with modern mobile medicine, but this is going to be so amazing to hear from your perspective as the founder of the practice. And another thing that I loved learning about you was that you were born and raised in Nebraska. Anybody who's born and raised in Nebraska is like my extended family. And so thinking about, you know, my own experience in Nebraska, being a doctor in the Midwest is very different, I feel, sometimes than being in more urban areas. So when you were growing up in Nebraska as a kid, what was your doctoring experience like? What did you experience as a patient? My own experience probably wasn't that different than other places with kind of went to the, the pediatrician. I didn't have anybody medical or doctors in the family, um, but I heard stories. You know, my mother grew up on a farm in, in Northeast Nebraska, and I heard stories about doctors doing house calls and her family paid for births at the hospital in Sioux City with chickens. You know, it was a bartering system. Of, they would Hey, I forget the number, probably, you know, a few hundred dressed chickens to the hospital that they, they would actually use then to serve the patients and staff in the, in the hospital. So I, I knew of a different, you know, Midwest kind of old fashioned way. Um, but my own personal experience was kind of the standard from a pediatrician. And I, it was instilled pretty early on in sort of respect and appreciation and, and, a, and a bit of reverence for physicians. My pediatrician, my, I was frequently reminded to save my life. I was born premature and 
This was right when they were developing artificial surfactant or, or using bovine surfactant experimentally. You know, I heard those stories of you were in an incubator and I saw, I saw the pictures of all that. Even though I didn't see him that much, it was, I knew Dr. Fletcher was this important guy in life and made a difference. And he was always, he was old fashioned, gentle, doc, took his time. It was a different model than what people get now. And I think that's so cool because, you know, our generation, it's not all the time that people in our generation hear about the home visit. Definitely not the payment in chickens for having a baby. Like, that's definitely not a not a common thing that we yeah. we in our generation hear. But, you know, I love that you experienced medicine in a you know traditional way, so to speak. But you also got this, you know, this is this is what medicine could be. This is what medicine has been up until the point that like you're, you're you, like you're saying you were born. So when we talk about you growing up in Nebraska and then you, you know, you went to Wesleyan and then you went to the East Coast for your med school training, you decided to do an MD uh, plus a master's in public health. So what led you to go to medical school and did you specifically plan to go to medical school to also get your MPH or was that something that happened along the way? Yeah, it was not a, a direct route to that. I went into undergrad thinking I probably would want to go to medical school, but it was one of those things where guidance counselors at the time were like, you know, you have good grades. It's like, you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, you know, banker. It was like five occupations advisor, right? There wasn't this breadth of you can do anything in the tech world yet. So it would be sort of saying, you know, why don't you think about physical therapy or medicine and just do the prereqs because, because you can, you can handle that. So. I went in thinking I wanted to keep that an option. So I was doing the prereqs, but then I kind of got sidetracked because I, I realized some other topics really interested me. And, and the one that stood out was sociology because it just kind of put a name to what I was always thinking about and wondering about and reading about, you know, in my current events and stuff, just picking up a, a news week or something. So I really was struggling actually to discern what I should be doing. I also had an early entrepreneurial spirit with my siblings doing a lawn business in our neighborhood. And so I knew I kind of liked business, if, you know, if you know what that means in high school. And so I was, I was really torn. I wasn't sure I was going to medical school. So I was kind of keeping my options open, taking lots of courses from a broad swath of things. And then I was very fortunate to get selected for a new program at, at Nebraska Wesleyan called Global Service Learning Program. And, and it, offered an opportunity to volunteer on a local, national, international level. And it was really just a, a small core group of students working together with the campus minister and organizing service projects almost through tiers. And through that, we went to the Dominican Republic and we were there working with a physician who was trying to build a new clinic. And that's where it just clicked that this is how it can combine it. You have to know about your community and you can actually solve some of your community social issues if people can't keep their jobs or progress in their in their family lives if they're not going by by medical conditions or ill health so it, that, that was sort of a light bulb that went off was, was oh i can I'm, i've always been good in science but the way i can apply that is through medicine and i can make a difference in people's lives so that their medical condition doesn't put them back economically and all these other ways right so that's where it clicked and I really doubled down on, okay, I forget sociology. It's very fascinating. <laughs> I think medicine is the way to put all this together. And I had taken some business classes too, just to make sure there wasn't something that really pulled me in and it just did. So that's where it clicked. And through those various volunteer experiences, then I, I also saw how you need to understand your community's health and your community's needs. And that's where I started exploring the MPH aspect of it. Back, you know, pre good internet. They had a, a Columbia review and a number of books. They would just review all the medical curriculums in the country. And while I was on a, a college tour of the Higgins Nepal, I took that with me and just read it cover to cover. I just looked at every single school and kind of got a sense of like what they're good at, what they're not good at. And UConn really stood out for being an, an early adopter of, you know, the old model was two years of school. I'm sorry, two years of books and you don't see any patients and you get two years of patients. UConn was one of the earliest to switch to like patients the first week during that school. 
that stood out to me. And then they offered the MPH for no extra cost um, at the same time. So that was my top choice. And I got in there and I was very happy. That's incredible. And I, I did not know that that was, you know, included if you wanted it type of thing. Like, that's incredible. And I, I don't know if that's still the case at UConn or if there's yeah, other schools. I'm not sure. But I, I, I don't think it's something that has up a, a free degree. And I was envisioning, you know, I, I had thoughts of being a commission doctor and going international. So I was in, trying to prepare myself to like, how do you do what a community assessment and investigate the problems of the community, design an intervention and measure if you're making a difference, right? It ended up just really flushing out my medical education. You know, you, you cover a lot of topics that directly impact the history you take on education and thinking about different risk factors. And yeah, and it was great. When you're talking, it makes me think about my experience at Creighton, where we had these breakout sessions where we would talk about things that weren't covered necessarily in the books and the lectures mm -hmm. um, that weren't necessarily pertaining to physiology, anatomy. When you're talking about, you know, this this idea that you were thinking sociology for a bit, but here's a way where you can combine medicine, combine, you know, things that you had been interested in in sociology that determine a person's health access, health outcomes, et cetera. Even if a, if a student in your class did not pursue the MPH, did UConn still infuse your lectures and your learning with always thinking about the person behind the, the actual anatomy and physiology? Yeah, for sure. I mean, some of it was direct lectures from the public health department professors. And then one of the other things that I noted when I was reading that book of curriculums of all the medical schools was this emphasis on the biopsychosocial model. And so UConn was definitely at the forefront of that. And so it was already kind of baked into the curriculum and then augmented by the fact that they had a school of public health on site. That's incredible. And for those people who are especially wanting to do DPC while they're in medical school, if they don't have a master's of public health available to them, what are some recommendations that you can make in terms of, you know, ways to think about your medical lectures or ways to think about your rotations or even resources that you might have for people to do their own, you know, infusion of learning about a community that they might want to open DPC in? Yeah. I mean, there's so much information available online now that it can be fairly self-guided. You know, there's something to be said if you, if you want to work professionally in, in public health, like we're in the local health department, state health department, things like that, you probably need a degree. If you're really just trying to take good care of your community and, and understand it better, you can just turn to your health departments and look at their data and their stats. Kind of fast forwarding to, to now with my practice, I actually just studied the map and, and figured out where there was basically a hole without primary care and just put a pin down and said, I got to find space around there. And part of that's, you know, business too. You don't want tons of other options or competition, but you can meet a need that's not being met. So you can just research what, what problems are going on in your community. You can get all the socioeconomic information. You're, all of your same local governments have lots of databases. You can learn a lot just that way about your community. And then it's getting out there and starting. And, and people in their training, just what you did mention at the beginning, question about students kind of thinking ahead. As you're treating patients in medical school and residency, think about the barriers. What are the barriers? And what keeps people from getting the care they need at all or at a time of basis? And in the form of colonists, just think through those barriers and not spoil the, the story, but that's how I wound up, as you can see, was where, why is this all so broken? What is the problem here? What is the barrier of my patients being able to get the care I want to give them and the care they need? And for me, I always return back to insurance. Like everything circle back to, well, insurance doesn't allow. You can't have more time, insurance will pay. You know, it, that was always the hindrance. And I think it's, it's so ironic that, you know, you're practicing now in a time where back in residency, like you say on your website, like you noticed that insurance was not the way to guarantee people access to good quality health care to a physician who knows them, et cetera, et cetera. Like all the value propositions of DPC, it, we're now seeing medical students really questioning that, just seeing, you know, what they're seeing in rotations, like even before residency and definitely yep. more residents asking, like, seriously, this is it? Like, how come we're only learning about fee for service? And so I love that the trend has been shifting to residents even having practice management um, experiences where they're seeing, you know, here's what we do in our clinic, but, you know, 
send you out into the community and see what else is out there. Physicians who own their own practice doing fee-for-service, physicians who are doing DPC, physicians who are working in a homeless shelter, whatever it is. I just mm-hmm. love that, you know, we're seeing more in people knowing that there's other models than just I show up as an employee and process my magic codes. And and I also wanted to to make a note here about who you're talking about, you know, reaching out to your local, you know, public health department or your local government agency that might have data. Here in Calaveras County in Northern California, we had a health summit that was put on by our county public health department. And it was insane, the the data that they do have. Like when we're talking about doing market research, I love that that's how strategically you chose to practice where you are. Also, it's it's backing up, you know, Dr. Falescu's argument that he mentioned in his podcast episode that, you know, you can open DPC anywhere. And especially me coming from a rural environment, that's absolutely an area where you can thrive. Your, your interview is coming off the tails of Dr. Stephanie Phillips, who's practicing in the poorest community in Georgia. And she's thriving like crazy because people need access to good quality health care. Mm-hmm. So with that, I want to go back to your residency years. You were at Georgetown Providence Hospital for 18 months in D.C., and then you transferred to Mayo in Arizona. And I wanted to ask you specifically because that that experience is fairly unique. Usually people like go to residency, they stay there. Some people like Dr. Adam Schulte, you know, they they switch gears. They weren't aim, aiming towards family medicine. Some people like Dr. Jana Rebus, they're going towards surgery and they switch into family medicine. But for you, because you transferred in after already being in a residency program, how did you look at your experience differently, given that you were at another, the, the Mayo program, and you had experience under your wings, plus you were, you know, very aware of the social determinants of healthcare in both communities? Mm-hmm. I really am grateful for that combined experience. I think it was a, a perfect kind of pairing to get inner city medicine with lots of pathology, low resource setting, and learning how to work in that environment, low resource for us at the hospital and our clinic and for the patients. So just how to get by when we don't have a, a functioning team, of, you know, support team and or really having to do everything yourself. And then understanding how to work around people's limited options for treatment or even diagnostics, all, all of that factor. So that, that was a great environment to start my residency in. And then transferring to the Mayo Clinic was sort of other, the flip side of it, coin that it was extremely organized. So I went from low resource, disorganized, and I'm a very type A person. So that was kind of driving me up the wall a bit, um, trying to work with, for example, we just in our clinic, we couldn't get a medical assistant where really. you're, you're waiting for your people to get roomed and you're sitting in the back in the conference room where all the residents are for like an hour, just waiting for your patient to get one. You can't even get started with your session and just being so maddened to get that, like, and not being, not be able to really control the experience of a patient. You know, I had, I still remember a very, very nice elderly couple who were apologizing to me that they were going to leave the clinic because they were just sort of tired of all the delays and disorganization. So we don't really want sort of the clinic experience anymore. We're going to go down the road, but we love you. We're sorry, but we're leaving. Going from that environment where you had really high quality physicians really driven to helping people, but being sort of disabled by the system, you know, being inhibited by the system. And then Mayo was like, so organized, you know, to a point that some patients complain, it's like a cattle call or something that, you know, it's like here, 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 but it does have its benefits of just making it very streamlined and efficient for people to get care and having fewer chances for thing for communication to go wrong or handoffs and just the patient experience is actually much higher that way it was a two-edged sword though because when you leave mayo nothing ever functions like that and so actually you you always have a benchmark they're like why can't you closer to this and it, you know even my own practice i'm like why can't i get back to that type of efficiency but yeah i, I loved having both experiences i got tons of obstetrics in dc not as much in, in scoutsdale it just wasn't a high volume service for deliveries. So I had a very balanced experience that I'm super grateful. That's awesome. And I think though, even, you know, with your experience in the two different environments, you mentioned on your website that within five years of completing training at Mayo, 
only one of your residency colleagues, and I'm assuming that's from your Mayo cohort, remained in family medicine and everybody else who was in primary care went to ACO management, bariatric medicine outside of insurance. They weren't doing true primary care, even with seeing what it could be at a place like Mayo. So tell us more about, you know, what knowing your resident classmates and knowing like what they experienced, what was it that kept you in family medicine? You know, at the time it was happening and, and I kept seeing my colleagues drop out of primary care. We, we talked a lot about burnout. That was the only term we could, we could apply at the time, but now we know it's moral injury, right? And in, in retrospect, it was moral injury for all of them. That's, that's what happened. So you had highly educated, highly capable, highly motivated physicians straight out of residency who can't do the work they trained to do. They, you know, they invest in their their blood, sweat, and tears and time into that. And you really wanted to help people, but the system doesn't let you do that. And it's that constant struggle of, more, you know, most people at a residency take a salary job, right? Because if you have debt, you need to start making some money, you need to have some benefits. That's the logical transition, but that makes you a cog in the wheel. And so you go from being protected in residency from most of the bureaucracy of insurance and coding and all that, you, you play your part, but you don't, you don't know the whole picture. You, you're sort of the, the frog in the pot that's being slowly heated up. And then after residency, you're in the frog out of the pot being just thrown into the boiling water. And it's an immediate shock of how broken the system is. And people try, you know, as best they can to fight through it and provide the type of care that they envision they would provide and that their patients deserve, but they they really can't do it. So within five years, they were essentially pushed out. And I'm I'm glad they borrowed the term from the military of moral injury, because I think that's so much more suitable than burnout. Because burnout, you know, these managers at, at big institutions now just are trying to help doctors cope with burnout and be stronger and more resilient. We you know, need to be more resilient. We need to be able to do our jobs the way we want to, the way we're trained to. So yeah, that was the context was everyone was kind of dropping like flies and these aren't weak people. It was people that just were working eight hour weeks and they yeah, got working 30 hours straight. And these are not people that would cave, right? So that was very disheartening. And I kept going because I didn't get into that system right, right away. I deferred joining the machine. I took a little sidetrack. I had taken a month during residency, just kind of created my own rotation, going down to Costa Rica and learning medical Spanish, rotating through various medical departments in San Jose at different hospitals, and just learning about their healthcare system, kind of from public health side, but also directly clinically how they approach it, how different it is. And door while I was there, doors were just sort of opening, and I, you know, I wanted to practice internationally at some point. And when those doors were opening, I decided to pursue it straight out of residency. So that was my little sidetrack was trying to open a, a clinic and I decided on Hako and being a tourist destination, I could have like, you know, some tourist urgent care. And there's lots of expats that live around there, plus the local population. So that was the goal. Never fully have it. But I worked on that for a few years and then realized I was being led in bureaucratic circles as a polite way of saying, you're not going to get a license here. They, they have great primary care. They don't want competition. They have an excellent primary care set up in the country. If I was an ophthalmologist or neurosurgeon, I would have been working within a month. But they were, they were getting, already getting primary care docs from Nicaragua and Cuba and other countries. So they didn't need an American primary care. And that was that was my little sidetrack. So, you know, a few years, tried to build that up and just working urgent care to you know, going back and forth where some urgent care. So I didn't get the moral injury that others had. It's so interesting because, you know, everyone has their threshold of like, I'm I'm done. And everyone decides, you know, whether they're done with medicine or they're done with fee-for-service medicine or, you know, whatever they choose to be their path. But it's so interesting because I think about how, as you're talking about, like you weren't exposed to the same level and extent of moral injury that you're co-classmates were, it really can make a difference. And I say that because as we're all practicing DPC, those who are like, sure, like I'll do a talk about DPC or sure, I'll uh, I'll have medical students rotate with me, whatever. You know, it really can be a like it can make such an imprint on somebody and it can really be a 
you know, a, a grain of hope in the hell that's out there when we're, you know, facing nothing but fee for service and a lot of clinical experiences. Now, knowing because, you know, I'm, I'm cheating here because like I know more about you probably than a lot of our audience members, but you got an MBA after you had your MD and your MPH. And just thinking about what you shared about, you know, you and your siblings had this lawn business. You liked entrepreneurial, sh- being entrepreneur- entrepreneurial, but it wasn't like, I'm going to do just business. I, you, you lean towards medicine. You saw, you know, how medicine was done overseas. You saw how medicine was done in D.C. and then in Scottsdale. Why did you pursue your MBA? And, and part of that question is, did you do it specifically so that you could open up a clinic in the States? So the last part the last is yes. I didn't have to do it with, with international work in mind, um, although I'm sure it would have helped to a degree with that. But what I, what I realized Costa Rica wasn't happening. And I all throughout my training, and maybe you heard this too, but I had heard from attendings or from legal, you know, they have legal lectures and stuff that just doctors are not good at business. And that was like a repetitious theme you know, of doctors not good at business, doctors not good at business. But being good at business is what could allow us to deliver care work. You know, instead of having non-physician MBAs setting up the practices and how they run and, and not understanding what we need is, is mostly time with patients, you know, that, that's a priority over all other productivity and measures you may have. Patients want time with us and we need time to do our work. So it just kind of made logical sense to try to shore up that side of my knowledge. And, and I was getting a sense of, I don't have enough to go off right now to launch something to do it well. I had. Looked into it with some residency classmates, and it's a daunting task, you know, just regulatory wise alone. I'm just trying to put all those pieces together, let alone trying to think about marketing and branding and messaging and kind of price things. You know, there's, there's so many factors to it. The AFP, I think, continues to have um, a manual about launching your own practice. Back then, it was a little a spiral bound notebook that was pretty good, but it was so focused on insurance credentialing, regulatory stuff with labs. And it, it was sort of just molding you into what existed. And I knew that wasn't going to work for me. This wasn't going to apply. I'm fairly entrepreneurial and, and, and risk tolerant, but then there's a, there's a level where you just want to be better prepared. So going to business school just made sense. So thinking about how resources are today for people interested in DPC, I think about how you know, there's checklists out there where there weren't before. Like you're talking about this little spiral bound notebook to which I laugh at because I'm like, we had so many paper based things before we had, like you're saying, when the internet was not as it is today. But I I digress. When we think about the resources out there and that people are much more aware of, you know, marketing challenges, how they've overcome them, things to do to have a more successful marketing campaign, you know, ways people approach pricing, hiring other people, joining other practices. Do you think that an MBA is absolutely needed for those who are interested in doing DPC? No, no, not at all. I think, you know, for some, it's a good fit. I had a good experience with it and feel like it, it gave me what I was looking for, but you absolutely do not need an MBA. There's so many more resources now, like you said, that are free and you can start from, from scratch or you have that foundation of what others have done before you to lean on. And then the, I think the other piece where you kind of touched on was like how to hire people or bring in partners and stuff. That really is a lost art because private practice is dying. So trying to get information from older docs of how they set up their groups and how they had a partnership track and just what the actual mechanics are, it, it's very hard to get that information out. Everyone who's, who did that has retired or sold their practices for the most part. I have been picking the brains of friends from medical school who went into other specialties, you know, ENT and things like that. They, they are still in, able to, to stay out of hospital ownership. They're not employed physicians. So I think it's another piece of this that realized was going to be so, so like such an unknown and so close to guard working urgent care. I got to take care of a brawl swap of people and some of those are old docs and I would just try to hit them up for advice and say, Hey, you know, what, would you mind sharing what's your partnership of real life? What, how did you structure things? And the few times they said, Oh yeah, I, I can provide that. Just call our practice manager and let them know you talk to me. And the practice manager shut it down. 
real quick. Did not want to divulge any specifics. We're not sharing documents. So anyway, a little, little sidetrack, but that piece of it is kind of, is touchy because you want to be fair to your colleagues, but also there's a way to do it. And doctors are not good at business. They don't understand overhead and all of the things behind the scenes that are expensive. And they don't realize how bad they were getting ripped off in the insurance world. So most stocks and stats I, I read were, if you're in the fee-for-service insurance world, your know, take-home is about 5 to 10% of your bill revenue. It's minuscule, minuscule, right? But you don't see the numbers for the most part. People have no idea. So You, to- you totally don't. Like, I, sorry, like I, I, get, I was just having this conversation with somebody and, you know, there are some fee-for-service clinics out there that won't even let you know how many people you have on your panel. So you can't yeah. even... You can't even try to estimate sometimes like what you're even bringing in. I, yeah. And then, you know, the the strategy that I love, I say that so facetiously, where it's like CMS is going to raise the rates for primary care and then the company is going to take their cut, which happens to be bigger than what they took before. And you mm-hmm. come out as a primary care doctor making less than what you had prior to CMS raising their reimbursement for primary care. So please right. continue, though. Yeah. Well, so and all of those things just are are more readily accessible to people wanting to start now. So I would reassure people if if you are considering going to direct primary care and starting your own thing, it's doable. It's not easy, but it, it's definitely doable when you have a stronger, easier foundation now. And it's a very collaborative community. Everyone wants each other to, to succeed. There's different ways to slice this and and some different camps get very opinionated on what, how it should be done. But you can make it whatever you want it to be for yourself. And there's going to be people to support you. So it's all surmountable and just head and shoulders above and better than being in the insurance world, especially being employed by a hospital system in particular. And I definitely would take a moment here to encourage people, you know, in California, we've brought to the CAFP's attention, like there's nothing on the website for people to learn more about the idea of direct primary care, the business model of direct primary care, who to connect with if you're wanting to talk to someone about direct primary care. That's Mm -hmm. something that, you know, whether you're in Wyoming or Florida or wherever you're at, you can reach out to people who are with potentially a bigger audience and ask them like, hey, like, where are the resources for DPC? The AAFP has had, I believe, since 2013, stuff on their website about them, you know, the AAFP supporting DPC and whether or not you're a member of the AAFP I just say that because, you know, there's some national recognition of what we're doing. There needs to be more. For example, the AAP doesn't recognize DPC as uh, as a model of delivering equitable care. We've had that discussion time and time again with the pediatricians who've come on to my DPC story. But, you know, if there is, check your your state website, whether you're internal medicine or family medicine, et cetera, and see if there's any resources and reach out to the leadership and say, hey, like there's, there's a whole bunch of us, you know, out here in the country. I was recently looking at data that showed that, and this is just a subset of data, that DPC practices had grown, I believe it was like over 800% in a very short amount of time. I would have to look at, I'll link that to your blog that accompanies this podcast so people can read the data specifically. But it's so interesting that we are definitely talking amongst ourselves. We are definitely supporting each other. With that, and going back to this whole idea that like you were trying to get as much information from group practices and whatnot. One of your first entrepreneurial uh, journeys in medicine specifically was opening mobile MDs. So can you tell us about Mm -hmm. mobile MDs and also how you got people to join? Yeah. Well, so mobile MDs kind of grew out of my Costa Costa Rican adventure because I planned to do house calls there. It just made sense to me to be able to go around that area and, and do house calls. And then I reconnected with a residency colleague from Georgetown who was happened to be doing households in Washington, D.C. And I told him what I was up to. We hadn't really spoken for years. It was, you know, just a, a Facebook reconnection. And I heard what he was doing in D.C. was seeing people at hotels primarily. So just travelers held by true households. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I, I was going to do the same thing, but in Costa Rica, it's not working out right now, so I'm, I'm probably going back to Phoenix, Scottsdale. I'm, I would probably do the same thing there, just give it a, a try. And we stayed in touch. The more we started talking about it, and I was pursuing the MBA, I thought, you know, this 
there's legs here. This can be something. And I basically kind of drew up the idea of pulling in current household physicians who are already doing this in major cities and let's network together so that we have a coverage in major cities for travelers. And then the travel insurers who are not health insurance actually pay very well. They actually reimburse. They're just generally happy you didn't go to the ER. So they actually reimburse well enough to sort of compensate for that trade-off. If you're not in a practice and in an office seeing, you know, multiple people generating revenue, you have to charge more for a house call that eats up time, you know, or you're not going to need people to do it. So it basically worked. The salvation was, was reaching out to these travel insurers and letting them know we existed. And then every time I can say this now, because everyone does business puffery, right? You have to sort of inflate your abilities and embellish a bit to grow. So I was actually at AFP Scientific Assembly. I don't think it was called FMX yet in DC in probably would have been 2012, 2013, I forget the year. And Monique from Quebec, my main contact for these travel insurers, called again and said, hey, you have a doctor in, I think that time it was San Francisco, and then next to Chicago. Every city she would ask, they would say yes. And then I'd frantically search on my phone and find a house call doctor and contact them and say, hey, will you take a patient from me? They're ready to go, just teed up, and here's your fee. And it was universally yes. I mean, all these house call doctors want more business. So... I grew it into a network that way, just by cold calling household docs and saying, hey, I'm a doctor too. This is what we're doing. I can send more patients your way. And so by the, at the peak, it was about, it was about a dozen physicians kind of scattered across the country, but, you know, low volume, it was, it was sporadic for them, but we, like, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. So we were all benefiting by just having a loose affiliation. So they were 1099, just independent contractors. They weren't hired. But by having one contact with the travel insurers, then we can kind of negotiate rates because they like to be able to call one number and not have to search themselves. That was that was a good priority. It was just make it easy for us. That's awesome. And just thinking about this space of doctors working, you know, generally under the same model, but all over the country. How did you manage something like an EMR? Did you have one EMR that everybody would jump onto or? Well, they, did- they kept doing what they were doing. So they, they kept their own practice independent and had their own setup. I think actually we did get malpractice to cover her visit. We had to get a specialty malpractice policy and those are hard to come by now. That company actually has gone under. Um, it was based in California and ran out of reserves and was shut down by the insurance authorities out there. But every, everyone was doing it the way they wanted to. If we just kind of had a set template for the civics that the health insurer might want for like level of visit and, you know, things like that. Just a simple handwritten. written. That's incredible. And just thinking about other doctors in the country doing this model, like I think about how DPC doctors, we all have our whys. Did you pick up some of the whys as to why these people were not in fee-for-service, why were they were doing the home visits before they even joined on with mobile MDs? Yeah, most of them were mid-career as opposed to kind of fresh out of residency like that was. And it was the reason why we all get into DPC. You know, the system doesn't allow them to practice the way they want to practice. And it's just, you feel torn. Like, to take care of your own family, you have to move faster and have brief appointments and sort of be on that treadmill. But you don't feel good about that. At the end of the day, you feel completely inadequate to the wrong word, but ineffective than what you wanted to do, right? And it leaves you also at night worrying, did you miss something? Is something going to go wrong for my patients because I, I was moving too fast or I just couldn't take the time? And then, you know, I dabbled in the insurance world, um, helping a practice after residency. It was also just the, the feeling of like being pitted against patients by insurance. You know, like we have sort of a set time limit for appointment and the patient thinks that's driven by us, that we're money hungry or just don't care. And it, it's just a necessity of how to keep a practice open. You know, you have to keep moving quickly. So mostly, most of the people that are doing households are often mid-career, had enough, want to get back to the basics and the doctor patient relationship. So cool. And when you talk about that everyone was a 1099, I want to ask about how you helped everyone, you know, collectively get more uh, visibility in their location. So how did you, especially with your MBA training, 
look at marketing for everybody who was involved in mobile MDs? Yeah, so we, we did a few things. One was requiring everyone to do a background check just so that we could sort of have that tag on our website that everyone, you know, if, especially where we were catering specifically to hotel and resort guests. And so to send someone into a hotel room, you know, they're a little skittish about it or hesitant. They never had something like that. And we wanted just to have that reassurance that we can provide to them that everyone's going through a background check. You're not getting any, you know, shady docs that are really doing this because they got pushed out everywhere else, you know? So that was part of it was like, we want to be trusted and verified. And then for each practice, we offered them, you know, marketing sort of branding to put on their website that they're part of this network, that they are, you know, have passed the background check and all this sort of criteria. And that was sort of the main extent of it for them. And then otherwise it was working from the top down of just trying to get more travel insurers involved and committed that they knew they could rely on, on this network. That's awesome. And in terms of trademarking, did you, like when somebody was working under a 1099 and then had like the copy for mobile MDs and the the logo, was there any franchising at all uh, involved or? Yeah, I was, we thought about that, but there weren't any existing good models of successful franchising. I think franchising just sounds like a dirty word to doctors. Like they, it, it sounds somehow cheap. Like achievements, I don't know. People picture Denny's and they think of a franchise. We we didn't go that route. It, you know, I, I thought about it, and even with later endeavors, I thought about it. But it's it's sort of a barrier. It's like a non-starter for lobby. Totally, especially when you think about you know the big corporations that employ a lot of us prior to opening DPC. They have Super Bowl ads and billboards, and you know it's like they just pop up everywhere with these massive buildings, and it's like the idea of being with something that's so impersonal, I feel also really impacts that word franchise. So let me ask you now, because you went back from, you know, the Scottsdale area to then going back to DC before opening Modern Mobile Medicine. So what was it that made you go back to DC versus practicing in Nebraska or the Midwest or staying in Arizona? Yeah. Well, so I was running the business side of mobile MDs and doing house calls in Scottsdale in the greater valley around Phoenix. But my co-founder was out here in DC. Time zone difference, trying to do meetings and stuff. It, it just was really slowing us down and making it hard to grow at the pace we wanted to. So I had always loved DC. I didn't think I was going to move away to a residency. It just, it just happened that that was the best choice at the time. You know, I just grew up. In the Midwest, went to the Northeast, down to DC, over in the Southwest. I'd seen a lot of the country, and, and DC was still one of my favorite places. I, I love the international aspect of our community. Traveled a lot. I've been fortunate to travel a lot in my, and even at a young age, just even through college. So I learned the value of diversity and just enjoyed being around a rich environment of lots of languages and foods and, and all of that. And I had a you know political interest to current events and, you know, a growing awareness of how what happens in DC affects all of this. So it was an easy decision to just come back. We need to communicate better. I like the city. It was just time if we're going to give this a go and really push it and try and grow it, I need to come back. In the midst of that, however, the households we're doing, you know, it's sick visits at hotels and resorts. It's there and there's no continuity. So on the one hand, it's interesting. You get to meet international travelers and people from all over. But the flip side is it's mostly after hours. People like save their complaints all day long, do their touring, do whatever they want to do. And then they wait till nighttime to reach out. And so it's, you know, lots of overnight earache evaluations and strep throats. A lot of it was like flight attendants who have just gotten off of flight at late at night and were feeling miserable the whole flight and need to be clear about whether they could fly or not the next day. So it was taxing too. I've just basically being a mostly a nighttime job. And I miss the continuity. You know, I'm a family doc at heart. The urgent care is kind of gratifying to fix things quickly, but I miss the continuity. So before we shut down mobile MDs, I was actually starting and, and we're, we had pretty far along but the planning for having a direct primary care branch of that for local continuity. Starting to offer house calls for direct primary care. It was nice that direct primary care, the membership model kind of just bubbled up around me, you know, during residency, 
as I told you before, I, I knew insurance was not the way to go. And that that's what was brewing this dissatisfaction amongst patients and doctors and just breaking primary care. I had explored lots of options of looking at whatever examples I could find, just hourly billing, or there was actually a, a doctor in Phoenix who had a chest timer in his room. So he'd walk in and, and hit things and start, start the clock and you only pay per minute. So you can, you know, that was his way of making it fair. They, you can have as much time as you want, but that's how we're going to do it. So there was various things that I had lots of spreadsheets trying to map out, like what would I need to charge? What I do to mimic the level of business. I was, I was exploring lots of just modeling lots of things. Like how can I make this a viable thing? And then suddenly there are primary can mold up that, oh, we should notice it like Netflix. Okay. That's easier. Let's do that. And then it, it's just the perfect, it aligns incentives, right? So it takes that element. Patients have been so, have grown distrustful about the finances of medicine. You know, I heard patients, you know, wondering if they're being called back into the office just so they can get billed for. But back then the answer was kind of yes, because we couldn't get paid to review labs by phone. And it's a lot of primary care. We interpreting and explaining labs is a huge chunk of what we do. And it's unpaid it's, if there's no code for it, right? Now things have changed, but back then that was a huge investment of time for patients that was not paid. So we had to call people back in just to over labs or just to discuss things that have nothing to examine. They're insomnia or their mood. You know, so many primary care topics do not require in-person care, but we had to do it to keep place open. It was just an immediate gratitude for people coming up with this simple monthly subscription fee. And then if I'm calling you in because you, I need to see you, it's, there's no additional pay. It just it purifies the doctor patient relationship that you put me on your little salary per month and it's your contribution. And I just get to take care of you for all of that. And you're not wondering by ulterior motives. It's, it's just about what's right. Love it. And let me ask you here, we're at the scientific meeting that you mentioned as you, you know, were involved in mobile MDs. How did you come to learn about direct primary care specifically? I believe that's a good question. I mean, the earliest summit was organized by FMEC. So I imagine it was probably from Larry Bauer or just online reading. I, I'm not sure exactly where I first came across it, but I heard early on about that first summit and I attended it. We actually had a mobile, we were a sponsor. If you go back and look at the program, um, Mobile MDs was a sponsor because we were recruiting. We, we had a booth at um, Scientific Assembly in San Diego and then had a booth at this, at the first direct primary care summit and we're trying to convince people like this is a viable model and you should think about doing it with households. It just makes me so happy to hear that because that's years ago and you're still yeah. killing it, right? And yeah. we'll get into pure primary care because that is definitely, you know, something that I love has manifested, I'm assuming out of all of the experience you've had already, but focusing on modern mobile medicine first, I was going to ask you, you know, who, who is your ideal patient? But what it sounds like is that your ideal patient was the person who values you as a physician and values having a physician who cares about them versus like, I would like to take care of this particular demographic. Right. And, it, and it's patients who really put it, prioritize their convenience. You know, that's who's looking for a household. So my sounding board as I was designing my practice was my sister who has nine kids and it's on stay rotation running back and forth to the doctor, you know, whether it's urgent care or the primary care doctor. So I was really trying to make it super convenient for families as a family doctor. And I didn't want to be in geriatrician. You know, when people think of house calls, I often have to keep the plan to them. It's not just for old people. This can be for everyone like it used to be. So. I designed it with that in mind of, of trying to make it very convenient and economical and maybe, you know, valuable for families with, with children. And then additionally, you know, anyone else who values that convenience, right? So I strategically market to families, but I, like any other direct primary practice, you track people who value the doctor-patient relationship, the time they get with you, that you're not a referralist, you know, where you're in the insurance world. People come in with their list and what do you, what's your first thought? Your heart sinks. You're like, oh crap, there's no way. Or, or even worse, you do the whole visit and you grab the doorknob and they bring out the list. <laughs> and 
and then they're trying to start the visit over again. So people who are who need additional time, attention, and don't want to jump around the way you you have to refer people in, in the insurance world, that's who comes out. So one hot button for me is the criticism that frequently comes out in JAMA and in, in other articles criticizing your private chair is that we're going to cherry pick all the healthy patients. That is a farce. That is absolute fiction. We attract train wrecks because we can slow down and, and figure them out and provide them actually time and comfort and compassion as opposed to someone who just says, oh crap, okay, here, go see nephrology, cardiology, endocrinology. You know, the radar system divides up their care, which is well studied to actually lead to worse outcomes versus having a core private care doc handling as much as they can. So I try train wrecks and I like it, you know, instead of cringing, it's super gratifying. It's challenging. You know, you actually get to like dust off the cobwebs of things you studied years ago and, um, learn new things. I'm always learning. I have time to research things. I'm not up to see on or, or I've forgotten. So I actually have that time to be, you know, the studious physician that I think we all need to be, you know, continually just continuing education, continuously learning. You're always a student. The regular system, there's no time to pause. For totally. And, you know, I'm, I'm right with you because when people say, oh, you're concierge medicine, oh, you're, you know, you're cherry picking all those. It's like, you know, I, I give so much praise to Dr. Emily Silverman. She is the host of the Nocturnist podcast, internal medicine physician who wasn't really sure what DPC was. She came to the conference in, I want to say, Kansas City in 2022, um, the DPC Summit. And it's like if you're, you know, if you're writing for these publications and you're like, but I I also think that DPC is concierge and it's cherry picking. Come, come to DPC Summit. Come talk to any one of us in our clinics and you will see that everything that you just said is so true. And it's like, where is the the zooming out of, wow, when we really piecemeal everyone's care, just like you said, you know, you have to see that, like, you know, I have to, and I'm sure you do too, we have to remind our patients like, you actually don't need to see the podiatrist for your callus to be removed. We, we actually can do those sorts of things. We can take care of a lot of things, like you said, though, when we have the time. So, yeah, I definitely challenge anybody who might be listening and writing for those journals. Like, you know, check us up. We are literally breaking all of those fallacies that you just said. So love it. I frequently mentioned my first patient to find me is still with me. And she is by far the most complicated patient I've ever taken care of, both medically and socially and economic issues and everything going on. You know, there's definitely a cherry picking going on in her primary care. People who are healthy and don't want to see the doctor don't sign up. They don't come to us. It's people who need care, not in care, they are going to use the service. So I've, I've devoted hundreds and thousands of hours to my first patient at this point. And she pays me what she can. She sometimes pays me what she can. So I'm a little sensitive to that criticism of of Jerry. It's it's just garbage. And like you're saying, you know, no matter what your patient is, what background they're coming from, and this speaks so much to your, you know, interest in knowing about communities and public health. But it's like, like you just said, like you have a patient who might not be at the level of payment that other members are. Or they might be healthy and want a doctor when they need that doctor who knows them. Or they're a person who has multiple issues and nobody can figure out. DPC allows a space for every single one of those people, no matter, you know, who you are. Most of us on our websites is just like, this is how we practice medicine. I mean, on your website, you said this is our philosophy. It's like, if you understand that, you understand what DPC is. And uh, so, again, I'm beating that dead horse because I totally agree with you. When you opened, you were completely mobile and then you eventually got a space for patients to see you at. So at what point, because I I had this conversation with Dr. Cindy Rubin over dinner and we were talking about how, like I also opened as mobile uh, home visit and then telemedicine only without a space. For me, it definitely limited how many people I could see in my practice. And Cindy was saying the same thing. So when did you decide that a space was going to be helpful to your practice? When not enough people knew I existed. So I'm kind of curious how you got started too and got numbers because 
No one was Googling for house call doctors. Like no one ever knew it was an option. If you're not on Google Maps or elsewhere with a physical pin that would come up and search for primary care or otherwise, no one knew it existed. So I was trying to build up, not getting numbers and figured, well, just having a place to hang my shingle and have a, a dot on the map would help. So I started off with just renting. It's a, I'm still in the same building for now. It's a wellness center that lets different practitioners rent suites. And so we have like black massage therapists, acupuncture, psychotherapy, colon hydrotherapy. There's a whole mi- broad mix of wellness rent to profession. So I just rented like a half day once per week so that I could be listed there. And then I started growing where people were signing up. They were, they were sort of two drivers to getting the adding more hours there and more, more availability was some people were signing up and didn't want me to come to their home for whatever reason. And then, you know, people's preferences are private or they, you know, embarrassed how messy they are or for whatever reason, they just only wanted to see me in the office. So I, I went from one day a week and three days a week. And then I also had a corporate contract and most folks who live anywhere and households couldn't be offered to. So they had to come to me or I do onsite care. That was sort of the impetus to, okay, I need to have more availability. So first I started with every other day and that was working pretty well. Eventually I just booked a suite or every day of the week and then added a second room when I, when I got a medical assistance, we have a triage room and can kind of start the process there. So that, that was my story. How, how did you gain awareness and get patients when as, a, as house calls and telemedicine only? Yeah, I definitely love the question. And I am very grateful and very lucky that I had a presence in our community, a small community before I opened. And so the people who joined, you know, I, I say 80 percent, but I, I should go back and look at, you know, the, the people who joined in the first three months. How many of those were my former patients? Like majority, if not 80 percent, maybe more than joined my practice because they were like, we can't lose you as our doctor, like you specifically we need. So what is the investment that we need to make so that we can continue having you as our doctor? And then I've shared this in in other podcasts, but I literally like had a patient who was shouting from my porch in front of the post office to people in the town about like joining the practice. So it's like, we, it's a very different situation than like, yeah. I think about, you know, your, your locale, the director of primary care physicians of Pittsburgh, like they're, you know, competing with the billboard uh, companies like it's very different in California. But I will say that in terms of, you know, getting the word out there, especially in, in rural America, like if you don't have a presence and you're wanting to move back home and your home happens to be rural, you might not be, you know, known because everybody in the town knows that you went to doctor school and you're coming back. But it yeah. also, you know, it also matters like how you're talking about relationships and, and building practices through relationships. It also matters how you're building relationships within your community. So like Dr. Leah Gupta really highlighted that I love, you know, um, she went out to restaurants and would would say like, hey, I'd love to, you know, post about your offerings at the restaurant on my on my socials. And she would, you know, build relationships like that. And so there's there's like you said, there's many ways to skin the cat. But uh, I think that it definitely also is a different world now because I have people who they'll, my patients will tell their siblings and like, you know, Citrus Heights, like that was a case that I had. My 80 something patient told her sibling about, you know, what she was getting. And her sibling was like, what, what the heck? What, why don't I have that? And then I gave my sibling the contact information for doctors in Marmar, who's in Marmar, who's in Citrus Heights. And miraculously she had a patient. So even when our patients are talking about us, I feel mm-hmm. that that really also is helping us push this rock uphill. So, but yeah, that's a little bit about how I started. Yeah, that's definitely an advantage. If you can, if you can start your practice where you did residency and already have patients who are attached to you, that's the huge difference. You know, I had just moved across the country, had no foundation, zero patients, and just trying to gain visibility. Of course, you know, being away for, I guess it was five or six years, you know, I wasn't in touch with the specialists or anybody else to have referral network of them being aware of me more. So it's definitely a challenge. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend moving to a whole new place and starting if you have no connection or no, no foundation there. Moving back to your home state is different. Like you said, if people are just aware, I think that can work. But um, yeah, so that was my process. Starting from zero and trying to blow it. 
And definitely, you know, if you know that you're going to move to a particular area because like your spouse found a job there, whatever the case may be. I mean, you can if they have a like a UPS store, we don't because our UPS store is like 45 minutes away from us. But like you can establish that dot on the Google map before you even move. I mean, Natalie Gentili, who's who's one of the uh, direct primary care physicians of Pittsburgh, she did that while she was in Mayo in Minnesota. And even though she was from Pittsburgh, she started posting socials you know, in Pittsburgh, you know, you can tag your Instagram, your socials in a location that you might not be physically in. And so, you know, having that SEO building as much as you can before you um, start, definitely a thing you can do. And then like what I did is I had my arnolddoctor.com would not suggest that to people because I had so many people say like, is it DR or D-O-C-T-O-R? Like, it was very confusing. So that was lesson learned on my behalf. But when I switched to Big Trees MD, I just switched where the link would take them to. And so even though, you know, they were they knew me from ArnoldDoctor.com, I had not committed to Big Trees MD as the name, but that's another way that you can just continue to build leads and build SEO while you are not open, so to speak. Yeah. That was created by us actually. Yeah. But yeah. The line can do this sort of get a little bit of momentum going even before you launch. So that's a great point. Everyone should know a little bit about SEO. And there's definitely much better options now for reasonably priced uh, help with that. And you can start a wait list. You can definitely start building some visibility. Absolutely. And when you opened, you described how you started incorporating physical space into your practice. But I wanted to ask, because going back to building relationships, learning what you did from people who were in, you know, specialty practices or group practices, you eventually brought Dr. Marguerite Duane onto the team at Modern Mobile Medicine. So how did that happen? Because she, my understanding is she was formerly your professor at Georgetown. Yeah. So she was one of the attendings when I was in Georgetown. And we didn't have all that much interaction. She was, she was one of our community attendings that would come in and precept and make rounds into us on a rotation. So if I happened to be on inpatient, you know, I'd see her every few months, maybe for like one, one day weekend rounding or, or something along those lines. So I knew of her, but we didn't know each other well. And then fast forward, you know, I transferred and then was in, was in Phoenix and I was pursuing training in the Creighton model of natural family planning. So. The courses are taught at Creighton. It came out of Creighton, so they're out of Omaha. So that worked out well for me. I could go to class and see my family in Lincoln. So I had done the first half already a few years prior, and I think this was the second half. And I walk into the, the conference room at the hotel, and who do I see but Dr. Duane. So you know, I went and reintroduced myself to her. And we got reacquainted, and then we just stayed in touch from there. So when I was finishing residency, she actually reached out to me to see if I, she was at um, Catholic Charities Clinics at that point in Washington, D.C. Um, she was the medical director, so she reached out to me to see if I'd be just, and being the medical director at any location they were opening. And this was right at the kind of Costa Rica moments. And so low pay for a charity organization versus trying out Costa Rica. I had to tell her no thank you and, and give Costa Rica a try. But we, but we stayed in touch. And then as I started doing the households um, under mobile bees for the, the hotels and resorts. I reached out to her to see if she'd be interested in, in being one of the DC physicians and taking some of those. And then I let her know that, look, I, I really want to get back to primary care. And she had stepped away from clinical care to raise her children. I kind of paused her clinical care and was looking to return. And so I said, look, I, I'm going to, rather than do it under mobile bees, I'm going to spin off and just do direct primary care under a new practice, a standalone, give me a little bit of time to set that up. And when I have the organization and everything ready to go, you can just be independent and take care of your neighbor, take care of your community. We're not physically that far from here, we're that far from each other, but it, with DC traffic, you know, it's like, it's impractical to like share office space or anything, you know, it can take forever. So she was based up in, in North DCC, in Brooklyn, in the Rome Catholic University, if you're familiar with that area, and just wanted to take care of her community. So it just worked out well, and I could set up an umbrella organization for her to do that. And that was the model I launched with was based on the experience of all my residency colleagues leading primary care. I wanted to make a good job opportunity for docs, just wanted to do what they were trying to do. So 
from the start, I set up everything to be nationwide with you know, national accounts for practice, our land accounts were nationwide, negotiated and, and, and were investigated to get as low cost EMRs and just try to, to make it an umbrella organization that anyone could just sort of come join under, not to start from scratch. And it's hard to start from scratch and not everyone wants to be a business owner. So that was the model. She was the first one to join. And so I was doing it down here in Alexandria. She was doing it in DC. I love it. And I love that you said, like, give me some time to just set that up. Like, give me, give me a few. And then I'll I, have a new business tomorrow. Look like, at you. I had, I had practice. I'd already done it. I knew, you know, I knew what the check boxes were and I could, I could crank out pretty fast. And then we just had to, you know, I, she was a sounding board and I, I wanted to make sure she'd be happy with the end product. So asking what were her must haves or, deal breakers or, you know, what does she want her practice to look like and what does her community mm-hmm. need? So just figuring out pricing to cater, you know, we're in different communities. We got to sort of bridge her neighborhood versus where I live. Like where can we find a, a price that works in both places? So all, all those kind of conversations and then we could launch. I love that. And, you know, I, I think about the amazing physician recruiter that uh, my the company that I used to work for had, they let her go after 12 years, uh, you know, without any reason, in my opinion. And I remember that when she started talking to my husband and I, before we moved out here, the conversation was very much around like, what what are you looking to do? And then like you're talking about that frog in the pot. I see lobster in the pot. Everybody's in a pot, some kind of animal. You know, it's like we go in and then nobody ever asked, what is it that you're wanting to do? Like we had, I, for me, it's like I had to ask, like, I would like to get colonoscopy started. I would like to be able to, you know, do X, Y, Z. But it wasn't ever past that physician recruitment conversation set. What do you want to do? And are you achieving that? So I love that you had that conversation. And I think it's important for people to think about, you know, if you're bringing somebody on, especially like a clinic that you opened, you're bringing somebody on, culture matters and culture definitely feeds down or it trickles down into the patient experience. So having, you know, the discussion about like, what does it look like to join the practice? Like, what are you wanting? What is the the person you're joining wanting? And seeing if there's, you know, a, a place where everybody agrees that would be beautiful. And we we are seeing that more and more. Like, you know, I, I say this because I recently was at their clinic, but Dr. Emily Scott and Dr. James Gore, they have two physicians who are 1099s at their practice who've joined on and they weren't necessarily wanting to open up their own, but they joined because Halcyon Health was open. So I love that. Yeah. Now, when you talk about how there was already autonomy and this feeling of autonomy going into joining the practice, how did you have practices that were similar and how were they different? So we were similar in that we catered to families. We had a lot of families with young kids. It was, we still, one of our frequent signups is, is parents who have a new baby. You know, we get newborns all the time because it's so preferable to take care of them by house call and I'd be in a journey environment, you know, in a waiting room ever. So we had a lot of overlap of just the demographics of taking care of families and, you know, trying to sort out the whole vaccine issue, which a lot of DPCs kind of struggle with. So we had a lot of overlap with that. I'm, I'm sure talking about, you know, I took the crane model, particularly where I was training for physicians and medical staff to be able to apply it to medical problems and, and use it and assist with diagnosis and treatment. She really is one of the leaders, maybe she didn't toot her own horn, but she's really one of the leaders in the country, if not the world, on educating medical people, you know, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, everybody about these different methods, advantages, disadvantages, and, and incorporating them into medical practice because it's a lost art and it's been modernized, right? So used to be standard training for nurses. When I was flying back from Oahu with my crane model manual open, the middle-aged lady, middle-aged lady next to me looked at the diagram and said, oh, seen by carton or whatever. It's, just, it's a German term for a circle fluid stretch. She just called it out. She's like, oh yeah, we learned that in nursing school. It, it used to be part of curriculums. It just faded away. So Murray is one of the most knowledgeable people and a leader in our field. And so her practice was very heavy on fertility treatment, fertility awareness, workups to diagnose infertility and treat it, PCOS, any, any hormonally related GI issue. These methods can be extremely helpful. So she was heavy on that and 
I had damned it early. I, I, in retrospect, I took that training too early in my career because I didn't have patience to practice it with, you know? So I should have had it later to be able to actually have a panel to work with. So I had a foundation. She was the expert in that. And so we sort of diverged there where I would just defer or refer sure people to her. And that's ultimately why, why she left because she really, that's her focus. And that's who everyone finds a tribe. And you, you figure out what you're really known for, what, what your passion is. But clearly she's a standout. She broke off into a really fertility focused practice and then just maintained some of her previous primary care patients. Absolutely. And, and when you talk about uh, when she broke off from the practice to open up her own, how did your practice adjust in terms of, like I think about, you know, when my husband was told that they were, the clinic was going to a non-physician model, like here's all these patients, especially in our area, who are like, what are we going to do? And then, you know, not all of them were able to stay at the clinic is my understanding that he worked at. And so I, I, I think about asking this question because seeing what's happening in my community when a doctor is no longer available as an option for people to access. Yeah. One sort of, I, one thing that made it a little easier tr- to transition was that she had a small thing. So it wasn't a lot of people affected and basically I gave them the option of transferring to me for office only because they're too far for me to relisten and get to for households. They had the option of virtual primary care only which was starting to come up more and more at that point as a proven all, you know, has its critics, but it, it was an existing model already. Or just transitioning to another practice. There was a few families that were close enough in the district that I could take on for households. And so we had a mix of all of it. So a few people moved over for households, a few people switched to office. I don't think we had any takers on virtual at that point. We didn't necessarily understand what that could be. I think we just had attrition with people deciding they didn't want to drive to Alexandria. They just found other care. It's interesting because, you know, I, I was just talking with somebody about how there's a difference in numbers. Like you just pointed out, you know, there, the, her practice was not 4,400 people trying to find a doctor where there is no care. So yeah. I, that's, that's really great. I, I'm glad you, you know, shared what you did just because, you know, especially if somebody, you know, they, they decide that a life change is going to happen. Like they, something happens, they have to, like Dr. Sharon George, she had to go and take care of her family member. And that's, you know, around the time that she closed her practice down in Southern California. So there's always, things are coming down the pipeline always, like our lives are usually not stagnant and the same every single day and same thing with our practices. So let me ask you now with regards to pricing, because like you said, you know, you, you had your spreadsheets, you're trying to figure out pricing. On your website, I, you know, I was looking at this before our interview just to, to really get a good feel of the different options. And I think that, again, it's like you, DPC allows anybody to come and get a doctor. You don't have to have a seven-figure salary to access a direct primary care physician. But you have your standard, your plus, your premium. You also have options for after-hours calls. You have options for non-members in the office. And then also, like, thinking about your sister and her children, like, you, you say, you know, if you're wanting a vaccine, like a flu vaccine, like, and you have multiple people, let me know so we can arrange that differently than you would like a one-off visit. But how did you work through all of your knowledge and your training, um, your education as an MBA to come down to your pricing? Sure. The first thing to start with was, every, you know, everyone else was doing office space, unlimited visits. And I then saw like a bad idea for households because <laughs> people could be calling you back very frequently. And then time invested, it would just, you would just not be making enough money per hour, bluntly, you know, just would not be worth it. So going off of that sort of premise, this research, the frequency of visits by age and other demographics, and it, you can see it's, it's a bell curve, basically with high utilization for infants and elderly, and it, and it just drops precipitously in, in middle age, right? So... But still, the average for most people is four visits or less per year. So that's what we started with, was let's have a basic one. I think the actual number is, is three visits or less. So I add in an additional one to make it four and a little cushion if people have reassurance. And I can tell them, like, look, just data-wise, you're not going to see me that much. You're, you're sort of the basic bundle of households. If you need more, it'll be discounted. You know, we just add another individual one, but I, I'm fairly confident you won't need that. 
versus many people on the, on the ends of the bell curve that are very sick and maybe actually homebound and may need more frequent check-in. So I wanted to have these tiered options available where they would meet their needs. So that may allow us you know, to keep a lower entry level cost. You know, you sort of businesses are always trying to divide up the market to get as much of the market as they can, right? So there's like a stair set model of pricing and that's that's why cars are priced with these different packages and stuff because they're trying to divide up where where's people's limits? What motivates people to maybe go up to the next price here? Or how we bring in people who maybe are a little more price sensitive? What can we have for a base model? So sort of that line of thinking of, I want to have at least a, a basic membership that, that covers the vast majority of people and what's viable, and then go from there. So the premium, the original premium is not what you see now on the website. That's a, that's a recent revision. The premium really wasn't being used. Originally, it was basically just 16 visits. It was like the other ones kind of sent up 16 visits. One was using it. It was just taking up space on the website. So I revamped it, I think, last year to have it kind of like a, a concierge approach and like just bundling everything. So there, if we do mobile phlebotomy, there's not going to be charged. Your sleep shots are wrapped in. No uncle triage fees. And I can speak to that later too. But I wanted to see DP series who, who does charge a little speed bump fee for after hours calls. I, I just recently revived the premium, but it's, it includes some coaching. It's for people who really are, are trying to make a major sh- shift in their health, trying to get their diabetes under control or their weight. You know, they they have a project in mind. So now the premium really speaks to that. And I don't have many people go for it, but it, it's theirs if they want it. The family membership, we had standard and they just share the house calls. So again, it's based off of how many visits are they going to likely need? And I had a premium one as well. Nobody ever touched the premium for six years. It just wasn't needed. Or just recently had someone request something along those lines. So we revived it last week. I don't think it's posted yet. I don't know. But it was sort of coming up with a custom plan for a family that wanted more all inclusive. I try and keep it as simple as possible, but also you want to meet different tiers of needs, right? So. The mantra is keep it simple, but sometimes it doesn't meet everyone's needs or the practices. As you work towards building out options to get as much of the market as possible, like you're saying, or to appeal to as much as the market as possible, how did you look at, you know, what is the maximum that modern mobile medicine can carry in terms of patient load? Because you might have people who are accessing, who are wanting to access one-off visits versus your members. So I think about that in terms of providing quality access to care without recreating the the hell that we left in fee for service how did you think about balancing numbers that go along with your pricing that go along with the number of hours you have in the day to, to doctor great even as i was launching it was already a, a fair amount of data um, patient panel size it was workable for dpc you know with atlas md and and brian forrester and and some of the earlier adopters we knew what was manageable. They were recommending, you know, a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred max for office based practice. And I knew house calls was was gonna need to be half or a third of that just to account for time on the road. So I had that camp kind of in mind of um, four hundred, five hundred is probably the most we would ever take on. When the office side suddenly spontaneously came in demand and I and I grew that side. It actually allows me more capacity. You know, I can I could probably take six hundred, even seven hundred, if it's evenly split between office and households. But I'm sorting it out. You know, it, it was there wasn't anybody doing it before me that we can look to. We're we're still kind of feeling that as we go. The one-offs under I've heard other docs and lectures and, and at summits and stuff say you shouldn't do those. That gets back to the fee for service and the transactional nature of medicine. But when you're starting, it's why leave revenue on the table. People are looking for a sick visit in various like nursing home physicals or there's different things. They don't have a doctor and they have a need. And so part of it's meeting the need of the community. And part of it is if they don't, if you don't accept them, they're going to go somewhere else. And you have someone willing to hand you money to do your job. Why would you turn that away? So after I heard someone mention that in a lecture, it was probably my second or third year of practice. I actually calculated how many 
what the annual fees were for non-member visits. And it was like five thousand dollars, so five, six thousand dollars. And it's like that's not nothing. That really helps when you're getting started, you know? So I still offer it. We we start kind of restricting saying, I shouldn't be doing your checkup if I'm not your primary care doctor. It, first of all, it's too much time investing. I don't charge enough for that. If I did, no one would do it anyway. But also, if you're not, if you're not in it for continuity with me, you should be with, with someone else. You should be with a doctor who's going to know you and work with you moving forward. So we don't really allow one all checkups because it, it creates tons of work, lab orders, lab results, referrals, all that stuff. And just building a chart for one time visit, you know, flushing out. So it is more for, People are sick and they can't get into their doctor. They you know, are meeting those needs of their doctor tells them to go to urgent care and they don't want to go to the urgent care. Especially, you know, that really grew in the pandemic as well. Just lots of virtual visits, giving people reassurance or guidance on what to do. And then the goal is if they have a good experience, maybe they'll become a member. So I, I don't think you should be shooting people away or refusing, you know, one time visits. Just have parameters that you're comfortable with. Absolutely. And there's some services that are great fits for one off things like circumcisions. Like if you offer them for anybody, you know, but there's also a discount for your members. It definitely encourages people to look at what what does a membership mean? And mm. especially if you're taking care of a baby for a procedure and that baby joins, how wonderful is that? Like you get right. a baby, you know, who will know amazing primary care from day one. So I think that's awesome. Well, the first time you see them, it might not be day one, but so let me ask you here then, because you also allow people to pick appointments. So some people are like, no, no, no. Some people are, yes, yes, yes. We'll allow our patients to pick. How do you build your schedule in the back end such that you don't have our favorite double booking, triple booking that we experience in fever service, but also that you have time to, you know, have longer visits scattered with shorter visits? Yeah, that was, that was one thing I really insisted on with scheduling was self-scheduling. I always thought it was ridiculous for people to be on the phone, on hold, and doing the back and forth of, does this work? No. Does that work? No. I don't do this. Just completely inefficient. If, if we could all book our flights online, they were so used to doing everything themselves. And it's literally just clicking on a calendar. There's no reason to have that whole process of tying up a staff member and wasting the patient's time. Just let them pick. So I sought out a scheduling system that could allow for that. It's, you know, when you're slow, it's not a problem. Your schedule is wide open. You're, it's not an issue of double working or people not have availability. What I moved to as I've gotten busier is not allowing checkups on Mondays or Fridays without permission. So those appointment types are just not available because Mondays and Fridays are so busy with acute care. You know, everyone's been sick for the weekend, holding you hold your breath, wait to talk to me, or get an appointment. So Mondays are crazy busy. Friday, same thing. Everybody's trying to squeeze in before the weekend. So there's things you can do just with your template of making it, you're not rationing care, you're rationing lights in your care. So keeping appointment lengths, what you want it. I just linked in mine because I realized I'm running out of time every time because I'm thorough, maybe document too much. I don't know, maybe I talk too much. But I just linked in my standard appointments because I was tired of feeling like I'm right behind, like I'm rushed, I can't do my notes. I have that flexibility. There's no administrator telling me the appointment went. Love it. Now, talk to us about pure primary care because like I, I love that throughout your journey that you've shared here, you've you've kept pulling and pulling from your previous experiences. So especially with mobile MDs and then going back to DC, opening modern mobile medicine, what is pure primary care and who's a part of it? Yeah, so pure primary care is basically a spin-off from my practice to handle the employer-sponsored direct primary care. So, yeah, I said modern mobile medicine has a nationwide network and was doing some employer contracts under that. But, you know, then you talk to other docs, lawyers, and it was advised to have it as a separate legal entity. And it really is more of a management process, you know, an administrative role than the practice of medicine. So first, first it was just a brand or a line of service in my practice. So I launched that way and I operated that way for maybe a year or so. And then I formally split it off and got the, you know, separate tax ID and all that. So it's really to handle the, the employer side of things. And it just came out of sort of organic 
demand as well. So the house call network really wasn't growing. I interviewed and had a lot of people say yes to were on board and then not sign their tonight time contracts. They were just picking my brain to figure out how to do it and then they go do it themselves, which, you know, respect is fine. We're, we're, we're trying to grow the movement. But that's all that was happening. It was like dozens of phone calls and interviews with people telling them how it works. And then they, the network, you know, the, the eight sheets, which I guess three of us, not including the employer side. And I sort of add in some independent practices to help with employer contracts. And so, you know, all told, we were, we're still less than 10 docs, just sort of affiliated together. So I, I just started off in the same alone. And there was pre-pandemic, there was cold calls from brokers, from employers. And the, the final like, tipping point was a university out here. The provost was speaking at a business networking event. And I just stayed and chatted chat with him afterwards and told him what I do. And has he ever thought of it for the employees? And he said, I love this. I want this for our employees. Let you need to talk to HR. And I should have known better than the HR recommendation because they're, they're never open to it. They don't understand it. You have to talk to the CFO. Don't, don't bother with HR. So he really wanted for the campus, um, all the staff and HR shut it down because we did not have dots on the map, basically, what it boiled down to. So that was sort of the tipping point of, okay, I need to, instead of just spontaneously affiliating, I need to proactively try and get other docs and practices to just work together because we can all take patients from these contracts and we, we need, it's like a chicken of the egg. The businesses don't want to sign up if there's not enough doctors or practices to choose from. The practices don't want to sign up if there's not a guarantee of patients. So it's been a, a lot of that sort of, you know, back and forth. So I, I said, you know, for that, and it, it was more of a, you know, a lifestyle business. It wasn't like it was going all in, I was declining investment offers. I still get emails of there's tons of private equity that's just pursuing healthcare and direct primary care specifically. So it was a lifestyle business. And then and it kind of got tabled too with my own life and my family life, the pandemic. It was just on, on the back burner, but it, it's there to meet those demands or those opportunities now as they come up. So the um, opportunity still exists for anybody you know, who's out there and wants to be an affiliate. It was a godsend to me when I was getting started that I got some patients from employers through next era. You know, you get a nice lump sum instead of trying to recruit one patient, one family at a time. And then it, it's less risky for an individual practice to not have you know, all of the employees there because it's that contract goes away, you suddenly lose a big chunk of income, right? It, it's built from that, for that purpose. Like we can all kind of benefit together if we're affiliated. And it looks better to employers have their more options and we can all get a little tranche of patients and not be tied in for like a hundred or two hundred patients all at once. Awesome. So in closing, I want to ask one fun question. When people are thinking about opening their practices as a home visit model only, what are some of your favorite tools that you would recommend the must-haves to have in your bag? Man, I mean, the beauty of starting mobile is, is it can be very minimal. You can actually just go out with your set scope and things to measure vital signs. It can be that simple. That's not necessarily the, the fun part. I'm kind of a gadget guy. I like trying out lots of things and a lot of them don't work very well, but I, I like to give them a, a try. You know, I, I like my really compact EKG that connects to an iPad or, or an iPhone that has no stickies on it. Patients love it. It just wraps around them and you're not putting pieces on them. It's perfect for households. It's, that's one of my favorite toys. Just didn't have this originally. Um, and actually I should say, I didn't have the EKG originally. You don't need to spend money on that when you're first starting. That's a, later on when you have some revenue. But like the cardia patient oriented little rhythm checkers, that's perfect for a quick rhythm check. I mean, when I didn't bring my EKG and I spontaneously hear in a regular heartbeat, that's great to just say, look, it seems like you're an AC, let's do a quick check. So I love that, you know, it's a credit card size device you can keep in your bag. I tried out a sonic height measure that you would put against the wall and it would use like actual like ultrasound and it just was not reliable. So I had to give up on that. My kid's pediatrician has a new one in their office that is a newer, more reliable version, but I got the cheap Amazon one. Didn't work so well. Yeah, I mean, you don't need a lot of tricks up your sleeve though for households. It's, you know, 
do violent signs and have some, you know, primary bag, maybe a backup bag for procedures and senior in circumstances. That's the beauty of it. Love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayden, for joining yeah. us today. My pleasure. Next week, look forward to hearing an update from the doctors who opened their DPCs right after residency. Dr. DP Munkor of My Happy Doctor, Drs. Christina and Jake Much of Defiant DPC, and Dr. Lauren Hughes of Bloom Pediatrics and Lactation. If you've enjoyed the podcast and you haven't yet done so, subscribe today and share the episode with a physician you may know who needs to hear about DPC. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify now as well, as it helps others to find all these DPC stories. Lastly, be sure to follow us on social media. If you're wanting to continue learning more about DPC in the meantime, check out dpcnews.com. Until next week, this is Marielle Conception. Conception.